Welcome to Voices of Change. I'm Katie Capps, co-founder and executive director of the Get the Medications Right Institute, the sponsor for this podcast. On this episode, we will be speaking with Dr. Paul Grundy, newly elected president of the Get the Medications Right Institute and chief transformation officer at Innovacer. Paul is known as the godfather of the patient-centered medical home movement, and he has spent four decades focused on population health and a healing relationship of trust with primary care providers. Prior to his work at Innovacer, Paul spent more than 17 years as an IBM executive, where he was chief medical officer and global director of healthcare transformation, as well as a member of the IBM Industry Academy. He is also currently a healthcare ambassador for the nation of Denmark and an honorary life member of the American Academy of Family Physicians, as well as a founding president of the Patient Centered Primary Care Collaborative, now PCC. Paul served in the Carter, Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and Clinton administrations and is a retired senior diplomat with the rank of Minister Consular in the U.S. State Department. He served in Singapore for three years as a medical director at International SOS. Paul is also the co-author of Lost and Found, a consumer's guide to health care and provider-led population health management. Paul's also the subject of a newly published book, Trusted Healer, Dr. Paul Grundy and the Global Healthcare Crusade. The book, written by Dan Polino and Bud Ramey, focuses around Paul's life work. Welcome, Paul. Thank you so much, Katie. It's a pleasure to be with you. And listening to that history sort of takes me back to how this all began for me. I I grew up in, in, in Sierra Leone, West Africa. My parents were both working there. Um, as you know, Sierra Leone, Freetown was where the slaves were freed, and my parents are of Quaker heritage. And while I was a child, I I had an opportunity to really begin to understand the culture and uh, and the language. And the power of the traditional healer was so important. I began to understand that if you're going to have a place in the delivery system that was going to be accountable for managing a population with data, if we moved towards population health as we needed to, it should be in the hands of somebody who is your trusted healer. It should be with somebody who has a relationship of trust with you as your healer because we know how much more powerful that is. When I started medical school at the University of California, San Francisco, it was the same year that we had started the first academic program in health policy, and a guy named Phil Lee headed that up. He had been health in the Kennedy Johnson administration. I went down to his office that first day of medical school, and I said, I'm here because I want to do health policy. I, I re- very early thought that you could get the most bang for your buck if you really understood how to change policy, how to change government, how to inform government on delivering better care at better value. And um, so, you know, I've really spent my life trying to focus on that in my various roles. Um, that I've had the pleasure of, of being part of. And and there's nothing more important, I think, than getting the medication right, than, than the powerful tool that we've developed over the past decades of having appropriate medication. And well, if we could figure out what is appropriate and how to use it appropriately, we're really going to be miles ahead in terms of in terms of really supporting that move towards more effectively managing a population. And I think what's happening today with the pandemic, and I I was involved and and a lead for that for our government in Africa with with HIV AIDS, what's happening today in the pandemic, I think, is is really making it clear some of the issues that we've had, um, some of the solutions that work and don't work. I think this trauma that we're going through is probably going to have more impact on healthcare, how healthcare is delivered since anything since Flexner wrote his report in 1911 and Johnson passed 
Medicare uh, in the mid-60s. Well, it's interesting that you say that, Paul, because you have so long been a champion of primary care, uh, a, a real missionary for primary care. I'd be interested in, in you telling our listeners a little bit about your background and, and your work on team-based um, primary care related to population health and, and why you think at this particular time in our country there's a real opportunity to leverage that as well. So in my experience over the past 40 years of looking at health care was delivered, and I spent much of that time, you know, in, in focusing on that from the, the view of that trusted healer in a primary care practice in many parts of the world. And it broke my heart. I mean, what I saw our clinicians, our healers doing was spending only about a third of their time on doing what they should do. They should do two things with their time and only two things. Difficult diagnostic dilemmas and relationships of trust. You know, I mean, the worst thing that they could do with their time is having their butt in the patient's face and being a scribe and typing. That's a stupid use of somebody who is trained as many years as they've trained to sort out difficult diagnostic dilemmas. I mean, what I saw happening was the folks that really did a job well understood that their role was difficult diagnostic dilemma and relationships. Now, Behavioral issues, and every chronic disease has a component of that, that's probably better done by somebody who's trained as a behavioral. Medication management, I mean, when you see how they would interface a clinical pharmacist into the practices that I was involved in transformation in England or Denmark or the United States, I mean, boy, that adds a huge amount of power and support to the clinician um, who's focusing on difficult diagnostic dilemmas. Nurse case management, patient education, that's probably better done by somebody who's trained as a health educationalist. I mean, I just, you know, I just really think and really saw that, that if you really, if you really have that clinician trained in what they're best at, i.e. difficult diagnostic dilemmas, um, and that is their source of focus. The other thing that I think has been really, really interesting and important is as we move away from paper to data in a machine, <laughs> and that's been a mixed bag for most of our clinicians, you, you know, you need to have a medical home. You need to have a – and that medical home is the place where the data sits, the home for the data, not for the patient, <laughs> not for the doctor. But if you have data, where does it sit and who's accountable for the overall management of that data? And I think when the whole concept of the medical home arose some years ago with Cal C in Hawaii, it was with children with special needs. And, you know, children with special needs, that's team-based care, right? They've got school teachers that are involved. They've got, they've got behaviorists that are involved. They've got social workers that are involved. They've got community outreach. I mean, all of that's got to be pulled together into a single source of data. Interestingly enough, the, fir the first sort of Docs that really got that, and I remember seeing it as transplant surgery came online while I was in medical school was a transplant specialist because they quickly understood that they couldn't do it all. But by God, if they had a team of folks doing it, they all had to sing off the same sheet of music. That's the medical home. That's the home for the data. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Paul. But, you know, I think what we have found, and, and we're so delighted as a, as a new president of the Get the Medications Right Institute and your rich history and, and primary care and that intersection, you know, with the work of the Institute. Um, but we've seen that a lot of physicians are hesitant about team-based care that, that puts a pharmacist directly onto the care team. I mean, I'd, I'd be interested in your perspective about why that is and what do you think we should do to not only expand that, but what should pharmacists do to help convince physicians that an active role as a clinical pharmacist on that team is, is additive to the practice of team-based care? Oh, that's a great question and a great conversation. I mean, I think, and I think it's, it's not hard to understand why that happens. 
I mean, up until now, what Flexner organized for us in 1911 was a concept where the data that's now stored now stored in a computer is stored in your head. I mean, what we what we came about in 1911 was, you know, many many years of professional training, and the doc was the data storage device. And so, I think for many people, change is really hard. But that change of being the person who is ultimately responsible for everything, that change to the data is no longer the storage device is no longer the brain. I'm no longer the master builder building a cathedral. I'm part of a team building a skyscraper, right? That, that emotional change has been a very difficult transition for many, many people. But, but if you think about it logically, there are really three legs of the, of the stool for that change. I mean, the first, and I think probably the most difficult, is the cultural shift away from I'm going to deliver an episode of care, whether it's necessary or not, to I'm going to manage a population with data. I mean, that shift towards to, towards accountability for the population, whether they're in to see me or not, that shift towards, you know, I'm going to be accountable for what I do because the data is going to is going to tell the world what it is, you know, is, is really a huge shift. And, and that's something we've been going through the past 20 years and, and, and in some places further along than others. So the second leg of that stool that has to happen as part of this transition is that the payment's got to change. There's only one way to hurt a cat and that's to move the food. If we continue to put the food out in front of a delivery system and say, you know, it's all about an episode of care that's delivered by a doc, then you're going to get episodes of care whether they're necessary or not. I mean, if you, if you want to stop um, only focusing on episodes of care and manage a population with that data with team-based care, then you need to reward that. And that shift is going on. We're, 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 we're now at, at something close to 45 or 50 percent of payment no longer – purely fee-for-service, right? So that has been a huge shift, and it's going to continue. And with this COVID um, problem that's down, it's going to shift even faster. And and I think yeah. the, 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 third, the third leg of the stool is the technology to do that with, to pull together all that information at the point of care and, and, and be accessible so the doc is not spending, not spending eight hours on the weekend, you know, doing this, you know, data retrieval. So, so I think those are the three things that really, really have to, have to shift. And the, and the driving factors around that are are are, are also, um, you know, a, a demand by the buyers because the cost is too high. You know, an insistence on 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 on, on accepting payment change by the payers. And 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 the, the last thing I think that's really going to shift this is is the ability to communicate vastly different. And we're seeing that again with this COVID solution. I was just on the phone just before this call with a large delivery system that said they were doing 19 virtual care visits a week before this COVID solution, COVID's problem happened. And, and now now they're up to 17,000 <laughs> a week wow. um, with virtual care. I mean, this is going to wow. drive... These are, this is going to drive the, the trends that were already going in that direction. My kids are both in their 30s. They've never seen a teller in the bank. They never will, right? That younger generation, you know, knows how to use telehealth and, you know, or tele anything. But, but, but you know, we're going to just communicate vastly different. We're going to follow up vastly different. I happen to be a healthcare ambassador in Denmark, and we're now in our 15th year of, of doing of, of helping patients take their medication with remote monitoring. When you when you dis, when you push your chronic disease medication through the aluminum foil to take it every day, the system acknowledges that you've dispensed. And if you don't dispense it, you get to choose the bird chirp that you get to remind you, right? And and the system knows whether you've done it or not. But those kinds of solutions are, are, are available here. I've, I've seen them talk about it in Philadelphia. So, you know, we're going to be doing a lot of things now remotely 
certainly, I mean, I, I mean, look, in Denmark, they, they do dialysis remotely. They, they put a bicycle pack together and then they do digital monitoring and, and, and digital video engagement at home. Wow, um, so, that's you know, so, so we're really, we're really, I mean, again, I think, I think that, that, that hesitance is probably understood because we don't like change, but all those other factors, they're driving it, right? Whether they like it or not. Well, so clearly this is a cultural change. And as a physician, you are very familiar with not only the role of technology, but the promise of technology and advanced diagnostics and getting the medication right. So where do you think we can do more, Paul? Where do you think we can we can do more, not only to get the medication right through team-based care models, but also in leveraging technology, diagnostics, and then and then bringing the team together to ensure appropriate use of medications and gene therapy. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so much more we can do, and, and I think, thank goodness, that we're moving out of the information age and into an age of intelligence with technology. I mean, I think that, I think that programming a computer to help us launch a man to the moon and bring it back safely was doable. But programming a computer when you're managing 100 diabetics with 100 different points of references and 100 different personalities is not doable. And we've learned that, right? And I, and I think that, you know, that, that some of the, some of the principles that we've developed and how Amazon shops or how Google uses the map and other things that are, that are really, really able to look at patterns differently can really help us deliver better value. I mean, we now know in behavioral economics that taking something away from somebody is much more likely to encourage you to do something than giving you something. So, in the Danish model, if you don't ever dispense that chronic disease medication, you're going to get notified you're going to be taken out of the lottery, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, so there's there's tools that I think we can begin to bring online to really support how we understand how humans react and think about taking care of themselves. Uh, I think the other thing is right now, Katie, right now is really important. You know, there's never, never um, a crisis that's not <laughs> that's not a time of change, and, and this is the time. This is the time that that I am, you know, looking for those opportunities of what's happening in Washington, what's happening at the state levels, to really begin to engage in those people who can in, inform legislation, who can inform policy. In your role, sitting sitting at you know, sitting in Washington supporting us with get the medication right. And I know that you're looking at the same thing, and the listeners should be doing the same thing. This is a time to really understand that change is coming and and to identify those issues that have really bugged us for the last few decades and getting value for our patients and helping inform those people who are currently looking at making the system better because they have to make it better. Well, thank you, Paul, for that insight. Um, and for our listeners, that wraps up this episode of Voices of Change. Please join me in thanking Dr. Paul Grundy, new president of the Get the Medications Right Institute, for taking the time to chat with me and offer perspectives on a multitude of issues. I also want to thank our listeners for tuning in. To learn more about what you can do to help get the medications right, please visit us at www.dtmr.org. Until next time, be well.